I'm Spencer Levy, and this is The Weekly Take. In a world of media and entertainment, this is a show like none other. On this episode, we're going to Hollywood with a pair of real estate stars. We'll go into production and discuss the spaces where our content is made. This business is shifting from an entertainment related to a synergy of tech and entertainment. And the vertical integration of these companies is something that is now the future of this business. That's Victor Coleman, CEO of Hudson Pacific Properties, a forward-looking owner-operator of studios and tech space in Los Angeles and beyond. The LA market in the Southern California area is about five and a half million square feet of space. So we're almost three times the size of the next size marketplace that's out there. And that's Lou Horn, president of CBRE's Pacific Southwest Division, a region where backlots, sound stages, and writers' rooms all play a major role. Places, everyone. We're focusing our lens on an epic story about entertainment, media, technology, and real estate. That's right now on The Weekly Take. Welcome to The Weekly Take. And I'm delighted to be joined by my friend and colleague, Lou Horn. Lou, how are you today? Doing great, Spencer. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming, Lou. And Victor Coleman, thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you, Spencer. So during our time together, we're going to talk about a host of topics today, from physical production and support spaces to the fate of movie theaters and even whether the future of Hollywood will actually be in Hollywood. But to begin, I want to talk about the pandemic and specifically the cost of the pandemic to the entertainment and media industry. So Victor, from your perspective, what have been the costs of the pandemic and maybe any opportunities presented by it? The obvious jumping off the page costs right now is production you know, was halted from basically March in the United States all the way through till September. And so the protocols had to be put in place People had to evaluate the safety. They had to you know, change how business is being done from a level of pre-production, post-production, the amount of people on sets, the food services. I mean, there's a whole array of things that have changed. Now, as a result of that, I do think that you're gonna see a few things on the positive side initially pick up. One is the amount of production that's gonna come into play that's already coming into play now as we're in the third quarter Um, And fourth quarter going forward, the amount of production is going to be absolutely spectacular. There's this whole pent up demand and voracious appetite for content. In line with that, I do think there's going to be a tremendous number of ancillary businesses that are coming into play that are going to help with protocols, safety, environmental aspects that are going to revolve around COVID that were not even thought of prior to. Lots of services and related aspects on that. But clearly, the amount of dollars spent on production is going to go up dramatically, given the fact that it was a void for so many months. Let me ask one more question, Victor, if I can. We're using a lot of terms here, media, entertainment, tech. And are they the same? Are they different? How blur are the lines? How would you define those, Victor? I think all three of those are going to be across the board. They're all interconnected. They're absolutely blurred. I mean, media is how you're creating whatever the product is. Entertainment is enjoying it. And technology is the glue that brings it all together. You know, technology is the newest to the troika of media, entertainment, and technology, clearly. But as you as you've seen, the amount of dollars that are coming into the entertainment world is tech-driven dollars, whether it's a Google, whether it's an Apple, whether it's a Netflix, a Hulu, or it's a gaming company or the likes of that. They're all technology-related companies. So yeah, the lines are completely blurred, but I think each of them have their own roles. Some of the industries that we see are not just in the production, but we've done transactions on the industrial side where there's the creation of the monster, the alien. I mean, all of that is done here. Um, You know, all of the special effects that are the physical special effects are done by specific cottage industries that are in and around the L.A. area. Let's get right down to it, Victor. Hudson Pacific Properties is a company that focuses on the media and tech industry, focused on the West Coast of the United States. Give our listeners a little bit of background. How did the company get started and being more specific in an area that not a lot of people were thinking about, media real estate? I started Hudson Uh, right around 2007. And the objective of the company was to sort of be a little bit different than the mainstream real estate company that I'd started in the past and worked in the past. 
Um, and one of the areas that we sort of focused in on was the studio business and the media business. And, you know, I think a lot of people had looked back and said, you know, that was such a great move. It was so smart. The reality was this. It, we were never ahead of the curve. We were never um, smarter than anybody else. The reality was we saw an opportunity on buying real estate in a fantastic marketplace at the time, which was Los Angeles, in a sector that not a lot of people had looked at because we saw land value, we saw growth value and development value around media, tech, and entertainment. And so that was also sort of a little bit different and not mainstream that people looked at because the revenue sources were real estate rents, were operating company businesses, which are not synonymous with real estate ownership, and then ancillary revenue around that as well. But I can tell you, when I first bought the first level of studio in seven, a lot of people called and said, what the heck is going on? You know, you're buying an asset class that institutional real estate doesn't own. And that was the objective is to educate and grow around institutional real estate and the media and entertainment sector. I think Victor's being very humble because in 2007, a lot of people thought it was gimmicky. They didn't really see what he saw. So he's being very, very humble when he says that he was the early pioneer here. He absolutely was and is now by far the dominant developer in the space. And it's not like we're from a town where there's not a lot of developers. We have a lot of talent here in that space. But Victor really saw something that nobody else did. Thank you, Lou. Well, talking about seeing something that others didn't, Victor, give us a little bit more detail about your portfolio, where your assets are, uh, what they do. And the second question I'm going to ask you about being a visionary is, are you in the real estate business? We own real estate up and down the West Coast, and we've really focused on buying high quality, best in class assets and either repositioning them like we did with our studios or buying industrial projects and creating them into gaming areas for the gamers like Riot Games, which is owned by Tencent, or finding the corporate offices and building them out in the development world for Netflix and understanding their businesses and growing their corporate headquarters here. Um, having assets where you have Google being you know, massive um, positioned in terms of our portfolio here in Los Angeles in the Bay Area and up in Seattle. We're building a project um, here in Los Angeles, which is a converted mall, which will be Google's corporate headquarters in West Los Angeles. But the reality is, no, I'm not in the real estate business. I'm in the understanding business of what our tenants and needs are and providing the services. So we, Lou and I, are in the same business. We're both in the service and business. And I think the days of, you know, your grandparents' real estate companies that would collect checks every month and say, you know, thanks for being on our assets. Good luck. I'll speak to you a month from now when I get another check from you. Those are way gone. You need to understand your tenants' needs. You need to be partners with them in their growth prospects. And I think this is going to be an interesting transition for those landlords who haven't figured that out during the post-pandemic aspects. You're going to be way behind the curve because tenants need services. And I think the success of landlords are going to be the coalition of the landlord and tenant. And it's not about price. It's not about rate. It's about quality, comfort, and safety. I don't want to come across as uh, the chairman of Victor's fan club here, but... You know, he mentioned a couple of things here, you know, adaptive reuse. He took an old industrial building and turned that into the one of the biggest um, gaming studios in the country. He's taken ground up builds. He's converted office buildings. I think there's a lot of tenants that are following Victor by his reputation because he knows not only what to identify, but where to identify it, and then also what to build inside and what services to create. Well, I do think, listen, before this you know, the, the world that we're living in today before, you know, a lot of people provided services and people were like, oh, I don't want to pay for them or I don't need them. Now, I think it's just going to be part of the template. You're going to have to have safety protocol. You're going to have to have aspects of social distancing and, and, you know, PPE and the likes of that in place embedded. You're going to have to have access to food services and parking and the ability to have bike racks and the likes of that in order just to survive going forward. But could you just paint a picture for us Victor, how do entertainment and real estate work together? Yeah, of course. So our tenants on the lots today typically will film three days a week on the lot and two days a week on location. And so we, as a real estate owner there, with them as our service provider, are facilitating three things. One is we facilitate office space for them. So they have office space for pre-production, post-production. They have office space for their writers, um, and directors where they sit and they create the shows. 
The second aspect is they have the four wall sound stages where they're building out the sets and they have the mills where they build the sets out and then they produce the content there, lighting and grip. These are various different size stages. So those two functions indirectly are just like any type of real estate service that you would get paid for on a per square foot basis for a, you know, a year to year or two to three years or five years or seven years, whatever the production company is, they would pay you on that. Then each show also pays ancillary revenue. So that's technology driven, lighting, grip, it's aspects of food services, it's telecommunication services, it's anything they need to produce their content on our lots. And some is tangible and some is just operating business aspects. And so they'll pay as well for that. We are participating in the location shoots through the lighting and grip contracts because they're part of the shows. But what's shifted today with the pandemic is as we're now getting back up and running full speed ahead, we're finding more and more filming is going to be on the lot because it's a contained environment that the safety and protocols could be adhered to. And so the daily shoots are going to be going from what we're seeing three days a week to more like five days and maybe even more to get the backlog of content at the end of the day. So we think a, from a revenue source, it's going to help all of us in terms of the studio business growing going forward. And there's a backlog of content. Just the last thing on that, Spencer, when you look at allocating of dollars for if it's 100 cents on the dollar, it's almost a third, a third, a third, a third in the office space revenue, a third in the soundstage and a third of the ancillary revenue comes out of the pocket. Let me just dig a little bit deeper if I can for just a moment, Victor. A real estate 101 question. How do you have the relationship between yourself and the tenant? Is it a lease? Is it a service contract? Is it both? It's both. So we have a lease on site and, and the leases initially were year to year based on show or commercial, the actual commercial or the film, which would be a six month contract. Now, because of the demand for sound stages, we've converted those to multi-year uh, leases. So a Netflix or an Amazon or an Apple, which is the new guard or the second tier group, which was um, a Showtime and HBO Cinemax, which was sort of the guard before them, or even the conventional ABC, CBS, Fox, Paramount, Disney, Sony, they're all leasing now long term. So our leases on average are closer to five years and they're just changing shows in and out when the shows are done. Great. Now, Lou, most of this, not all of it, a lot of it's done in Los Angeles, and, and Victor mentioned there's some done in Vancouver, but Los Angeles really has this virtuous cycle of a lot of things that make the entertainment industry possible here. So, Lou, what is it about L.A. that keeps the entertainment industry thriving? Well, part of it is people think of TMZ as a show. TMZ is actually an acronym. TMZ is the 30-mile radius on the center point of La Cienega and La Brea. Any point after that 30 mile radius actually is more expensive to film. There's per diem costs, there's hourly costs, there's different kinds of union issues that you've got to deal with. I mean, a lot of these studios came out here, you know, close to 100 years ago, primarily from New York because of cheap land and weather. But now because of the concentration here, it's no different than any other cluster. There's 225,000 people, which is almost 50% of the total media population that works in this industry in California. Um, so the concentration is clearly down here. You've got this ecosystem here of talent that literally on a phone call, you can bring into your own, whether you're developing a game or whether you're developing a show or whether you're developing a movie, um, all is accessible in the LA area. And that's why there's always going to be a concentration of these kinds of larger occupiers in this space here. Well, I think, Lou, you mentioned the key word, and that word is content and the explosion of new content that's coming out today, Victor. So content, if you can go into how important content is to your business and obviously to the business of your tenants. Content is where the massive amount of dollars are going to play. Netflix, Amazon, or Apple, you know, this is where the world is going. And as a result, it is Los Angeles because the post and pre-production is all here at the same time. But you're going to find, you know, this business is shifting from an entertainment related to a synergy of tech and entertainment. And the vertical integration of these companies is something that is now the future of this business. And because of what we're living at right now through, you know, COVID, there is a shortage of content. People have burned through content because they haven't been filming 
um, since February of 2020. And so now all this sort of pent up demand that you're going to see is going to flow through. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens with obviously on the small screen. But the interesting aspects are, are going to be feature films and what's going to happen there. Because there's been a lot of feature films that are sitting in the can ready to go and they don't have a place to send them. And so when whatever happens at this next phase, that's going to be very interesting to see what's going to transpire and how successful that's going to be and how that model is going to change, because it's definitely going to change. Spencer, the other thing that we need to note is that one of the hottest areas in, in media right now is in television or streaming media that's happening right now. It used to be that one of the large studios would create eight to ten movies on an annual basis. Now you think about if there are eight to ten or 15 different television shows Multiply all those by 10 or eight for a season, but then multiple years. See, it's, a, it's an exponential growth when you go to the small screen, when you go to television and streaming media. So part of the nature of the way people entertain, and frankly, even a lot of this COVID has really accelerated a lot of that growth because there's such a demand now for uh, for streaming media. Well, I think Victor also suggested that it's going to not just demand for that media, but how we consume that media because of COVID uh, has clearly changed. And we've seen some of the very uh, negative and unfortunate announcements from large movie theater chains recently uh, that are struggling. So, Victor, the movie theater uh, is a little bit outside of the realm of the movie studio. But given how people are changing the way they consume that media from the TV, from the movie theater to their tablets, how much does that change your business? I don't know how much is going to change it and it's yet to be determined um, what the future of the movie theater is going forward because the protocols have not been put in place and the structures have not been sort of vetted. I believe New York is now starting to open theaters 25%. Where are the economics around that? I think we're, it's yet to be determined. And are motion picture companies going to release content around that? My guess is the good stuff they're going to hold and they're going to just try to transition all the stuff that's sitting in the can they want to get through. Now, there will be other changes in theaters for alternative uses. And how they're going to figure that out and who's going to make the claims around that, it's, it's interesting to see. Netflix is deciding to buy a couple theaters for their own production. Um, gaming companies want to use theaters to have full-time gaming hours and have that be live entertainment. And you can transition the seating around some safety protocols and the likes of that. I think you know the reality is um, the future of the theater business will change, whether it's forever, nobody knows that, but it's gonna change in terms of how that protocol is put in place. I still believe if you have a you know major motion picture like a James Bond, they're not gonna put that on the small screen streaming video because they know they're gonna make eventually a billion dollars on a movie like that. But not all the movies that they thought they were gonna make major home runs on are gonna be in the same success ratio going forward, clearly. Um, and so that's going to be interesting to see how much money is spent on the motion picture side. And are we going to see a bunch of $100 million movies made going forward? I'm not so sure. I think they'd rather take those dollars and put them into the uh, talent pool of small screen and being series or just, you know, streaming videos or pay for play. Well, one of the things you mentioned, Victor, which is video games, uh, which is in its own way content. So, Lou, how important is the gaming industry to the media industry? I would say the, I think Victor mentioned this before, and that's the combination now of technology and of internet interactive gaming. You know, Riot Games is one, Activision, Fortnite, you mentioned earlier. These are massive franchises that are impacting sports, they're impacting demographics that can be targeted now in a very unique way. Uh, the demographic of individual women or of younger professionals that are, you know, growing up and, and focused on different kinds of platforms is something that we're, I, I'm finding this out because my new son-in-law works for one of the big gaming companies and he's been living with me here with, in, uh, in COVID. And the amount of, that I see happening in that space is just extraordinary to me. And the franchise value of each of these games and the way that they're developing these games to have you know, experiential opportunities. I think you're gonna to start to see some theater actually turn into gaming opportunities where people come and watch gamers. I think there's gonna be definite transition in that space. But the gaming industry is, I think, literally rounding first base. I think it's yep. gonna get bigger. I would completely agree with Lou. I think when you think about the technological expertise of young people, the ability to interact 
in this world today is all through a median that's no longer face-to-face. -face. The ability for companies like Oculus and virtual reality coming to play, it is definitely at the very inception stage. And the growth prospects of gaming with other people around the world is going to be absolutely spectacular. And it will be the new form of entertainment. Um, you know, I think that the world of live sports is going to change because of this, because more and more people are going to be attracted to this aspect. It's faster. It's interactive. You have the ability to engage with others at the same time on multiple levels. So there's a lot of positivity around that. And as I said earlier, this is the merging of media and entertainment and technology. And that's why the money is being spent in absolute huge dollars into this area. One of the things you just mentioned, Victor, and Lou mentioned as well, is just this ecosystem of media and tech. I want to go into the tech side of it now. So, Lou, starting with you uh, in Los Angeles, Silicon Beach, and other tech hubs that are emerging in Los Angeles. And then, Victor, I'll turn to you about some of your properties up in the Pacific Northwest. But, Lou, Los Angeles and tech. Well, it's a massively important um, part of our industry, but it's, there's a personality to tech, and there's definite clusters uh, in Northern California, you get a lot of venture capital and it's focused on different platforms. In Southern California, a lot of the tech really is focused on entertainment and also gaming. And certainly the life sciences now. The life science, you could, it's not called formally tech, but it's becoming an enormously important part of our ecosystem down here. Tech, you could say the same thing about it. It's about highly educated workforce that you're attracting from the UCLA's, the SC's, that are coming into your space to try to develop something that's, you know, that's new and different. The tech part of our business is extremely important in Southern California, but again, a lot of it media related. Sure, and speaking of media related in Southern California, CBRE is uh, going to publish a report along with this podcast about the different locations of production for media, not only in the United States, but in Canada. And so Victor, I wanna to turn to you now, because I do know in addition to your holdings in the Los Angeles area, you have a tremendous number of holdings uh, in the Pacific Northwest, in San Francisco, in San Jose, in Seattle, and then of course, Vancouver. What drew you to those markets and how do they work together with your Los Angeles assets? Well, the synergies of the tenancy is, is pretty much across the board of, through all our markets, whether it's media, tech, or entertainment. But you know, the, those are all markets that are growth oriented, job oriented markets. You know, as a company, we look at our markets as great markets to be in, but we're expanding in those markets as well. In the media and, and entertainment side, we're looking at, as, as you mentioned, we're looking to continue to grow up in Vancouver, we're looking at Toronto, we're looking at New York, and we're looking at London as our core markets to continue to grow our portfolios in the media business, because that's where the growth is from a production, both physical and then pre and post. Spencer, let me just add to something that Victor said too, just to put it in context, the LA market in the Southern California area is about five and a half million square feet of space. Second is Georgia, Atlanta, uh, at around almost just under two million square feet. So we're almost three times the size of the next size marketplace that's out there. And it's based on a lot of that ecosystem that I mentioned earlier. 40% of the live action shows that were created last year were created in the greater LA marketplace. So it, I think it's a situation here where you, you, you've got such a concentration here. This is such a critical industry. It's our number one industry uh, in the Southern California and LA marketplace that I just think you're gonna see that growth here uh, continue to extend. Uh, Lou, in our national production uh, center report that's coming out along with this podcast, you also mentioned Georgia as being the second largest market in the United States for uh, film and television uh, and other content production. What makes them competitive to Los Angeles? Well, you know, it's interesting, uh, Victor, in Southern California and California in general, there are states and counties that have got full-time employees here trying to pull companies outside of California into lower cost alternatives. What California's greatest resource is, is the people that are here, the people that are trained in the technology, the people that are versed in the media business, the people that are that are, that are here because of the lifestyle and that sort of thing. But there's the concentration which attracts the cl clusters. What we're finding in not just media, but it's in other industries also, is counties and states offering massive subsidies or tax breaks or incentives to move into their locations. And they're material. They're material. And there's several examples that are out there. We, we still have the biggest concentration because no matter what the costs are, if the product doesn't come out as good at the end of the day, then you're not going to be at a competitive advantage. 
So I do think that California needs to be careful, but I think we've got to be very careful in the way that we're potentially upsetting some of this ecosystem. Well, I think the word we're dancing around here, and I say it respectfully, is cost. It's more expensive to produce in some places than others, but you're balancing that with quality, with that ecosystem, as you put it, with talent and capital and other factors. So, Victor, um, looking in your crystal ball, how does it look? How is it different five years from now than what it is today? There's a few things that I think are going to be um, hot points around production anywhere else. And Lou brought it up, whether it's you know tax credits, whether it's subsidies, whether it's quality of individuals, all those factors need to take place in markets for those markets to be successful. We've seen what happened in Michigan. We've seen what happened in New Mexico. We've seen what happened in Louisiana, where there have been short stints of production, and then they've gone. The sticking point, and the reason I mentioned Los Angeles clearly is the leader around the world, but Vancouver, Toronto, London, New York, they've been sticky. They've had the talent, they've had the ability to produce on a consistent basis, and people want to be there. I do think that model is going to continue in those markets, head and shoulders above others. The markets like Georgia, you know, they have a very attractive tax program. Tyler Perry is a very successful production company, and they've done very well attracting talent and retaining talent and growing the type of projects that they do in that marketplace that should go for a long time. Right now, the state of California, like some of these other markets, understand that this is an industry that's vastly growing, and we need to maintain our leadership and our dominance in the marketplaces in order for that to continue going forward. So in five years from now, I look at it as still being a massive success story, but there's going to be bumps along the road, and you're going to have decision makers say, you know what, I'm not prepared to do what they're asking me to do, therefore I'm going to look elsewhere. But Lou, let me turn that same question to you. What does the media and real estate business look like five years from now looking back? But I'm going to ask you a more specific question. What does the office business look like five years from now, looking back. Listen, the greatest developers that are out there on retail understand the importance of experience. They understand the importance of safety. They understand the importance of what they call a merchandising plan, which is when you go to one store, you're then able to go to multiple stores. I think in LA and Southern California, we've got a great merchandising plan. We've got the chemistry of surrounding ourselves with incredible talent, but then we've got the venture capital. We've got the understanding of this space. We're not building widgets here. It's We're building creativity and opportunities that are in, in multiple mediums. Listen, I think that the way that we're using office space is going to change primarily because of this whole idea about retention and recruitment of talent. And I think the creative companies are going to realize that we have an upside down hierarchy of, of, of an organizational chart, that I'm servicing the people who work here. I want to make sure that they feel comfortable, they're proud of my brand, and they're excited to come to work and learn from their colleagues. And to do that, I've got to create the right physical space, I've got to create the right programming, and I've got to do things that are going to be different than my competitor. Well, as two great visionaries in this space, I want to thank you both for being on The Weekly Take. Victor, thank you very much for joining us. Spencer, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Lou. Thank you, Victor. Thanks for everything. For more on our show and to find a copy of CBRE's new report on entertainment, media, tech, and real estate, check out CBRE.com slash The Weekly Take. We'd also love your feedback. If you found us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or another platform, please subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen. Once again, thanks for joining us. Until next time, I'm Spencer Levy. Be smart, be safe, be well. Be well.